Faith, what is it? Being sure of our hope, convinced of what we can't see. By faith, we understand the world was set in order at God's command. By faith, Abel offered God a greater sacrifice than Cain, and for his faith, God commended him as righteous. By faith, Noah trusted God and constructed an ark for the deliverance of his family. By faith, Abraham was willing to sacrifice Isaac, his only son, believing God would still fulfill his promises. By faith, Moses chose to be mistreated with the people of God rather than enjoy sin's fleeting pleasure. By faith, God's chosen nation crossed the Red Sea on dry ground and praised him as it swallowed up the Egyptians. By faith, Rahab the prostitute escaped destruction because she welcomed the spies in peace. Time will fail me if I tell of Gideon, David, and the prophets. By faith, they administered justice shut the mouths of lions, quenched raging fire. But others were imprisoned, murdered, and wandered in deserts, mountains, and openings in the earth. We are surrounded by this great cloud of witnesses. So get rid of every weight, of every sin, and run. Run with endurance the race set before us. Keep your eyes fixed on Jesus. He is the champion and guide of our faith. For promised joy, he endured the cross, thought nothing of its shame, and having risen again, has been handed his deserved glory at the right hand of the throne of God. So this is the second part of our series on faith. In fact, uh, a little created word here, faithing. There's no verb to the word faith. Faith is a noun. Uh, we see the word believe and believing is an action word, a uh, verb, but there's nothing for faith except now this new created word, faithing. It's the action of doing what is spiritually known, we know, as faith. There's a difference in believing because we can believe in a lot of stuff and have no faith. I mean, we could, I guess we could, uh, 
we could carnalize the word faith and say we have faith to sit in these chairs, but that takes no spiritual connection to God to sit in chairs, right? You can, you can sit in them because you believe they'll hold you up, and in believing you sit down, but that's different than faith. Faith is a matter of connecting with God about what he wants in our lives, and faith that is lived out, we are describing as this word called faithing. So last week I dealt with the perspective of prayer, prayer, intercession in the Holy Spirit, uh, fasting, seeking the Lord, connecting with God, and how it becomes um, a means of faithing. I don't want to minimize this. In fact, I want to tell you that last week's sermon is so imperative to what I would call basic Christian faith, and that is if we're not praying, we're not faithing. If you don't ever pray, if you don't have a prayer life, then you don't understand what faith is all about because faith, simply put, is not doing something that we can do in ourselves but doing what we do in God. And we'll never do what we do in God without a connection to God through prayer. So prayer is a continued connection to the Lord to find out what he's wanting for our lives. Prayer connects you to the Father, to the Son, to the Holy Spirit. And prayer becomes the instrument by which you can begin to see the miraculous initiated. So we're talking about faithing as an initiating of the miraculous, of taking what God wants to do and making it happen in our lives. So today I want to I take us to a step in and continued with this whole thing of faithing where I talked about prayer. And the last point of, of Sunday, uh, last Sunday I said prayer, prayer and intercession and fasting. And then I talked about worship and praise and thanksgiving. And I want to I separate that out because I think that's a whole uh, individually by itself means of faithing. And what is that? Praising. Praising. Initiating the miraculous through praising. God's people have always been a kind of people that God looks at and goes, you know what? I'm going to step in the moment they start worshiping in the midst of their problems. It's, it's in the valley that we begin to sing and worship and praise that God goes, that's my kid. You want to have a testimony? You want to have something that really is a matter of faithing that stirs heaven and initiates the miraculous? Learn how to be a praiser. Good times and bad times. Learn how to worship. Um, praise comes from a Latin word in our English language, pretium. It's in your notes there. It means price, P-R-I-C-E. But I don't know if you knew this, but the word price and prize are very similar, and they both come from the same Latin basis. Now, originally it meant to set praise, meant to set a great price on, a great value on. So when we praise God, we're placing a great value on him, on his acts. Then praise becomes a great weapon for spiritual warfare. I want you to understand this. Praise establishes his price, the price, the, the wonder of what he's paid for us and his love for us, but it also possesses the prize. Is as we worship God, there's this, this prize that's connected with our loving God that is literally uh, supernatural and wonderful. Faith or praising is faithing and doing faith. It's faith in action. It's initiating the miraculous. I'm going to read you some praise verses. I've given you the the references, but I didn't write them out. I just want you to listen. As I read all these scriptures that you have in your notes, I'm going to read them just back to back. Are you ready? Here's Here's the kind of praise that needs to go out. Lord, you are my God. I will exalt you and praise your name for in perfect faithfulness you have done wonderful things, things planned long ago. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, my soul, all my inmost being. Praise his holy name, for the Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trusts in him, and he helps me. My heart leaps for joy, and with my song I praise him. Because your love is better than life, my lips will glorify you. I will praise you as long as I live, and in your name I will lift up, your, up my hands. 
Why, my soul, are you so downcast? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. For great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. His greatness no one can fathom. My mouth is filled with your praise, declaring your splendor all day long. Then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all that is in them saying to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms and hymns and songs from the Spirit singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. Finally, Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Praising God is communicating who God is, what he has done, what he can do. Could I add in what he will do? It's not just a matter of what he can, but he's going to do. Praise is a weapon against evil and the enemies of God. Praise releases faith and initiates the miraculous. And I got to tell you this, y'all. In the midst of of your valley, if you can praise, you'll find out that it's very possible you're going to have somebody else in the valley you didn't know was there near you, and they're going to hear it, and your deliverance becomes their deliverance. Your victory becomes their victory because praise initiates the miraculous. And God doesn't do little miracles. God loves to do big stuff. (laughs) <laughs> I got to re- tell you some stories today. You remember the story of Jehoshaphat? He's one of the kings of Israel, Judah, and the Bible tells us that that uh, the army had come against him. It's in Second Chronicles 20 that the armies of, of Moab and, and uh, Ammon, and there were several, and they, they had come to destroy Jehoshaphat, and this army was huge, and there was just no way that they were going to be able to beat this, this army. And, and so the Bible tells us Jehoshaphat, who loved the Lord, just began to pray and cry out and say, God, what are we going to do? And God personally showed up and said to him, this is, this is the strategy, Jehoshaphat. This is not your fight. This is mine. Now, I got to tell you this. That's a good word. If I could take care of a fight by doing something God's way and God says, you don't have to do anything, just do this, then I want to do that. Can I tell you that what God did for Jehoshaphat works for us? What did God tell Jehoshaphat to do? He said, I want you to take your singers and your worshipers and I want you to put them in the front of the army. And as you march to battle, I just want them to sing. Now, I don't know about you, but I bet you those guys didn't sing quietly. Now, maybe they even, when they first started walking, thinking, I mean, I'm I'm serious. If If you're thinking about this, we're at the front of the army. All the guys with spears and swords are behind us. We ain't got nothing. And we're coming against this army that's three or four times bigger than us. I got a feeling they maybe thought, let's sing quietly. (laughs) I got a feeling, though, as they marched, they knew they couldn't do that. And the Bible says they began to sing loudly. They began to sing and worship. I believe they even started chanting or rapping. You didn't know that, but Old Testament people rapped. Uh, that's a part of, of worship, by the way. You can, you, can praise, you can praise by singing, by shouting, by speaking, by clapping your hands, by raising your hands, by dancing, by stomping. You, you know, praise can come out a whole lot of ways. And these guys, I believe, began to sing and shout the praises of the Lord. And the Bible says that the armies that had gotten together, these three groups, really didn't like each other to begin with, and they decided to fight each other. And by the time Jehoshaphat and the armies of Israel got there, the enemy had killed each other. Well, I don't know about you, but if I'm going to set up and fight against somebody, and all my buds around me have told me, this is a, this is a no-brainer. We're going to beat these guys. This, it's not a big deal. We're going to take them out. They're, we got, we got three times as many as they've got. And you hear that army that ought to be scared. You hear them singing worship songs as they're coming. I don't know about you. That messed me up a little bit. I, I got to tell you this. Praise messes the devil last thing the devil wants is for you to, uh, to be excited and to worship, knowing that we're entering a battle of uncharted terrain. By the way, we are in a battle. If you don't think this is a battle between right and wrong, good and bad, evil and righteousness, 
Worship and praise will be our key to victory in days days ahead. We have now entered into a season of war. When we begin this last millennium, change and conflict have accelerated. We find ourselves groping for stability, for footing, for positioning. The world is changing so quickly that many awaken with anxiety to each new day. The church is being prepared to enter its most dynamic season of warfare, worship, and harvest as the Lord tarries. I I tell you what, the church cannot just be like we've been, prayerless, faithless, powerless. The church of Jesus Christ, for the most part, has not made much of an, an impact on our world, but that is changing Because God is calling the remnant to a place in him of faithing, of praying, of connecting with God through praise and worship in such a way that God through us then can release the miraculous that will initiate change in our world. If we're going to stay here, we're going to stay here victoriously. We're not going to stay here defeated. We're not going to stay here saying oh, every morning, every day, oh God, what's going on? We need to stand up and rise up every morning, every day and have a song in our heart and declare that we are more than victors in Christ. And as we sing, as we pray, as we witness, as we testify, as we glorify the Lord, God will set up an ambush against the enemy and begin to pull things down. The saddest story In the scripture I referred to last week or the week before, found in Psalms 137, where it says, uh, by the rivers, we lost our song. The enemy of Babylon taunted us and said, hey, you singers, why don't you sing for us? But we were in, we were in bondage. We were, we, we were being hurt. We were being overcome. We were being overwhelmed. So we took our harps. We hung them on the willow tree and we quit singing. Just all the, the, the enemy wants from you is to tell you to shut your mouth and stay over in that corner and be quiet. We're going to beat you. We're going to lock you up in stocks and bonds, and you're going to just sit there and be quiet. And we say, no. You can cover our mouth, and we'll hum. Bind our hands, and our little fingers are going to dance. We, we're not going to let you stop the praises. Do you understand why the devil hates your praise? Do you, do you have any idea? Have you any concept? Do you know who he was in the beginning? The Bible tells us he was the anointed cherub. And, the, and there were, as far as we know, there's only three archangels. There was Micah and Gabriel and Lucifer. It was, he was called son of the morning. The Bible tells us in his glory he was the worship leader in heaven. In fact, he had every instrument down pat. He could play them all. He had harps and trumpets and pianos and everything built right in him. He was a walking drum set. You look at it. It's amazing. I don't, I don't know what that meant or how that, whether, you know, it was one, a one man marching, art, marching band. Have you ever seen it, you know, with the drums and trumpet? And the, I, I, it was all in him. And he was so beautiful and so wonderful. And he was the worship leader in heaven. And he thought this was so good. I'm so wonderful and I sound so great. I think I'll sing to myself. And God said, you want to sing to yourself? Okay, let's see what you can do without me. He lost his position and place as song leader. And I don't think he's been able to carry a tune since. He gets so angry when the church rises up and sings. When the people of God worships, when they praise, when they they exalt his name. He wants you quiet because he doesn't like it. But the Bible tells us that this this is doing damage to him if we only knew. Let me, let me explain worship and praise here in, 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 a, in a concept of two things. One is the ascent in worship and then the return or the descent or the descending to war. When we release a sound of worship, can I remind you what I'm talking about? Singing, declaring, testifying, shout, clapping, dancing, stomping, waving hands, raising hands. These are all parts and part of what we would call praise and worship. Doing that releases a sound that the earth must respond to and I believe is in fact responding to. I I just immediately right then thought again about Jesus when he rode into Jerusalem and the people were the, the religious people that don't like singing and don't like praising do you know worship? Do you, do you understand worship irritates people who are kind of 
kid folk to the devil? If, you, if you're bothered by praise and worship, you better get your heart right because there's something going on. They, they, the only people who have a problem with worship are the, are the devil's bunch. And so they, they're screaming and hollering, shut those kids up, quit those people from shouting and worshiping. And what did Jesus say? If they don't worship me, the rocks will cry out. Then can I just say to you, the rocks are listening I, I spoke about this. You know, Romans chapter 8 tells us that the whole creation is groaning and travailing in pain, waiting for the redemptive work of God to belong to the saints, for the children of God, for the sons and the daughters of God to be revealed. I'm telling you, it's all about us being revealed. It's, it's a matter of us crying out in praise and in worship because there's a revelation even to society and to the world around us. And I believe to the inanimate objects. I, I, I believe even the living trees and the flowers and the and the hillsides respond to the sound of music there is power in lifting our voices and acclamation of the true and living God we can speak it we can sing it we can shout it the expressive power of our hands generates a sound we can clap we can play instruments we can lift our hands in worship we can stand we can bow we can dance all of these things are worship and praise now, can I, can I encourage you how to do these things, how to ascend? Because these things move us into the presence of God. The songs we sang today, that first song, wow, over and over. All we want is for the Lord to come and inhabit our praises. We, we want him to be here. But you don't want him just to be here, here. You want him to be here, here. And so praise and worship isn't something you ought to be just doing on Sunday. If you didn't know it, there's plenty of music out there. There's plenty of praise that you can attach yourself to. There's plenty of good things that will stir your heart and stir your spirit band. And I'm glad you got it right on your phone. You can carry it with you everywhere. So let me give you some steps here to make sure that you can ascend and stay there. In other words, it ought to be a place that we go off and not just once in a while visit. So number one, give God some time. Y'all, it's so easy for us to just be absolutely overcome and overwhelmed with, with stuff around us that we don't have time for God. You know, if you don't have time to sing or to worship or to shout a little bit, you need to realign your timing. I mean, some of us, we struggle even to get to church on a Sunday or a Wednesday night or just to, just to have a little bit of time out of a week. Y'all, I'm, I'm saying cut out some time in your life and change it. If other things are getting your time, could I suggest you maybe give that to praise and worship? If you're on your Facebook too much, change it. Put, put some, instead of Facebook time, put some worship time in there and, 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 and put on some good songs and, and, and sing and worship. Uh, when you're driving, don't just let that be empty time. Put on, put on some music. Turn to his radio or do something that will begin to fill your heart and your soul. If, if you're not studying, you're not reading, I, I want, want to encourage you to, to do that, but, but let the outgo of what you have coming in Become praise and worship in your life. So give God some time. Number two, abide. Learn how to, 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 you know, praise continually. Now, I pray all day long, but I don't want to just pray all day long. In fact, it's so often that I'll be, I'll be going somewhere and something will happen and I'll feel like I need to pray and I'll, I'll start asking the Lord about something and I get almost guilty. And I go, you know what? I have asked you about 30 times a day for different things, and I hadn't stopped to praise you. And I just quit it. I just, I just, I reel it in and I go, Lord, I want to thank you. You're so wonderful. I thank you for all you've done. You've been so grand and great. Do you understand how praise should be continually on your lips? You learn to abide in it. Uh, number three, worship and praise God continually. It will, it will not work to worship God just on Sunday or occasionally. We must worship Him throughout the day. I think that's what I just said. But number, number. Four, Four, I put use the word. I don't know if you've ever done this, but you ought to praise through the scriptures. Psalms has 150 of them. You could read, you could read five Psalms every day. Psalm number one, Psalm number 31, Psalm number 61, Psalm number 91. You can read one Psalm a day and then every month, I mean five Psalms a day, and every month you could reread the book of Psalms. And what's cool, if you've never done it, is you can sing a lot of the psalms because you knew that was what it was. It was a psalm book. And so it's really cool you can start doing it. And if you don't even do that, then I'd, I'd suggest to you that when you read it, read it as praise. 
Don't just make it David's psalm or, or some other person. Actually put your name in it. Lord, I want to praise you for being this and doing this and guiding and directing me. Thank you for keeping me from my enemies. Thank you for bringing me. Do you understand? Make it personal and let praise come using the word. And then number five, I put express your heart. You know the coolest thing about praise is that it ought to be very, very intimate. Have you ever sung to the Lord out of a heart of, of just love? And it wasn't a song that anybody taught you, you made it up. First Corinthians, the, the Apostle Paul says that our worship is such that we ought to sing in the language of our tongue, like English, but sing in the Spirit. We should pray in our tongue, but then also pray in the Spirit. I will tell you this, if you say, I don't know if I can, I can, um, I don't know if I can rhythm, rhyme, uh, you know, my song, well, you hadn't listened much to modern songs because <laughs> most of them today don't rhyme. <laughs> That's a really good thing about modern worship. It's like, that don't rhyme a bit, but it still was a good song. Um, can I suggest to you, you don't have to rhyme. Sometimes, I, I got to tell you this, God's bigger than your praise. If you had every word in the English language and you could say it all about God, every word that glorifies him, you couldn't start to glorify him because he's bigger than your language. That's why the language of the Holy Spirit can send praises heavenward. And I pray in the Spirit and I sing in the Spirit very, very often. I, I, I made mention of this last week and a week or two before when I preached on David. It's so important for us to understand. David, David when he went to battle against Goliath with his sling and his staff, that what he was basically doing was he was by his testimony slinging the fact and the promise of his inheritance. You'd have to go back and listen to that sermon if you don't understand that. But, but I, I, I made a mention last week, and I want to say this to you again, that when we do spiritual warfare with praise and worship, it's not about aiming at our enemies. It's about aiming our praise and worship at God. He then takes what we have sent to him and he repositions it and he sets it at the right place and he sends it back at 100,000 million times the speed that we send it heavenward to take out the enemy, to bring war against those things that have, whether it's your fear, your anxiety, your depression, your discouragement, your, the, the, a financial issue, a, a physical problem, a, a thing in your life, here's what you do. Learn how not to just keep begging and pleading with God. Speak your praise. I mean, speak your prayers. Let him know what your heart's concerned about, but then turn it to praise. And as you begin to faith in praise, as you faithing, as you praising, that thing goes heavenward. And once it hits that atmosphere up there. It's like God exponentially sends it back down in this warfare thing to the enemy. God has established a new authority in his church to break through to the third heaven. This is where God is, to gain the heart of God and carry that revelation back to earth where we can accomplish his will. As we do, we will change the very atmosphere around us. God will bring down to earth as it is in heaven. This is what we pray for every time we pray the Lord's Prayer, right? Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Um, this is a quote from Chuck Pierce. So, so I, I want to share this with you. I want you to understand this. The, the Bible tells us that the enemy, the principalities and powers, they rule the heavens, but I believe those are the second heavens. Now, let me show you the three heavens. Our atmosphere is the first, but above that, somehow between where we breathe and, and, and have our, our life, that's principalities and powers that work uh, to just hinder the flow from God where the third heaven is and where we are. And, and it's like the piercing through of that. Remember Daniel when he needed an answer from the Lord and he began to pray and the Bible tells us as he was praying, it took days and days and days. Finally, when the angel got to him, he said simply, the moment you prayed, God heard you and he sent me to come. But I've been fighting the principalities that were in the second heaven. And there are times, y'all, where we can't break through seemingly. I don't know if you've ever done this, but there have been times when I've prayed where it's like I, the heavens are brass and I can't get through. It's not that God has done that. It's that the enemy has tried to hinder and stop what you're asking God to do. Well, here's what pierces it. It's praise and worship. Turn your petition or, or send it a little stronger with this praise and this worship and it will to propel it through the powers of darkness until it reaches the heavens once it reaches God 
then the issue is that the, the devil can't stop the return because God then pierces through those second heavens where the principalities and powers are and brings to earth what he has said in heaven. Let me give you a psalm that I think describes this. Psalms 149, verse 6. It says, let the high praises of God be in your mouth and a two-edged sword in your hand to execute vengeance on the nations and punishments on the people to bind their kings with chains and their nobles with fetters of iron. This is talking about spiritual warfare, y'all. To execute on them the written judgment, this honor have all his saints, so therefore praise the Lord. It is the praises of God's people that literally become high praises. What does that mean? It gets out of low praises. It's not normal praises. It's high praises. It's the praises that penetrate the darkness and penetrate the powers of, of the enemy and reach the heart of God. The power of faithing or praising does some things that are really important. I want you to listen to these. Number one, praise and worship sets up his throne. His throne established in our midst and in our hearts. He inhabits the praises of his people. What, what does that mean? It, the, the scripture says in Psalms 22, 3, he sits enthroned on the praises of his people. And as we worship, as we praise, as we do this spiritual warfare, the biggest deal about victory we'll ever have here is knowing we're not alone and that God has just come and set up his throne right in our midst, right in our presence. And I know you've been in services where you've sung and worshiped and all of a sudden you have felt like God has all of a sudden entered the room. You know that feeling, do you not? You, not, you know you sense when he's here and when he's moving and when he's working. Can I tell you this? That ought to be a part of your life because you know this as you worship him and praise him. I'm asking you to do something. I'm not asking you just to, to say it. I, you know, yeah, we love worship and praise. Why we sing, we go to church on Sunday. We love it. That's really cool. I don't even think it's good enough for you just to say, yeah, we love those new songs we get to hear on the radio or we get to listen to on YouTube. I, th I thought that's wonderful. But unless you connect with it, unless you make it your praise, God is still going to inhabit those praises, but he needs to inhabit your heart. And so when you put your heart into motion as you praise, as you make it your song and, and your worship, y'all... Don't come here and let the team sing for you. Amen. You know what? You need to be singing these songs. You need to be declaring them. If you say, I can't sing, then say the words. Just, just let it come out of your mouth. Let it come out of your heart, y'all. This isn't a spectator sport. This is something we do on Sunday to try to encourage you to do it Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. It's a matter of, of knowing that as you do, you set up his throne. Praise not only sets up his throne, but also tears down the walls. You say, I'm having a battle? Praise through it. You're, you're struggling financially. You're struggling physically. You're struggling emotionally. Praise through it. You're having a battle in any, any relationship? Praise through it. Because there's walls that have to come down. Do I, can I, should I share with you the story of Jericho? This impenetrable city that could not come down and it stood between Israel and the promised land. And God said, the walls are going to come down. And the craziest, craziest war tactic that had ever been done in the, in the history of wall war, warfare, God simply said, I want you to do this seven days in a row. March around the city. And as you march around the city, I want you to do some silent praising. If, if God's good enough and faith begins to rise up in you, it'll get to the place where being quiet is almost like bottling a shook up Coke. It's like, what do you think the people of Israel felt when Israel, when Israel's great leader, Moses, has just died? He's just been taken away. And Joshua's the new dude. And God says, tell the people, you're going to bring down this wall that's so thick that they can ride three chariots side by side across the top of it. This was a big wall. They built their houses inside of this wall. On top of this wall. You're going to have a six bedroom, five bath house on top of the wall. It was impenetrable. 
Much less, it wasn't even just built out on the ground. It was built on a mountaintop. And Joshua says, you're going to walk around this place. And I just want you to sing. Sing quietly. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Just sing quietly. Hallelujah. No, don't you get excited. Do that all day long. Everybody, three million, are walking around, boys and girls. You imagine, you imagine mom and dad keeping the kids quiet? It would take, it would take hours to walk around that city. Second day, third day, fourth day, fifth day, sixth day. He said, oh, by the way, on the seventh day, you're going to do it seven times. I got to have a feeling inside of me that somehow faith was building during that whole process. Because he said, on the seventh time around, I want you to shout out the first thing you think. I got a feeling that praise was about to explode in three million people. I don't know what that must have sounded like. But I want you to understand this. It wasn't just their sound that did what happened. It was the amplification of their praises that made those walls fall down. The Bible doesn't say the walls fell out. It said the walls crumbled down down. It's like the mountain opened up and sucked in these walls except for one little piece of wall that had a house on it with a scarlet, ro scarlet cord falling out of it from a lady named Rahab. Everything else fell. Can you imagine that? It's kind of like God said, I want to show you how cool this is. I can leave any part I want. And, and God won this great victory through their shouting, through their declaration, through their praise. Praise tears down walls. Number three, praise brings deliverance demonic oppression. I don't have time to go into all of it. Remember Saul? He was, he was not living for God, not doing right. King Saul and, and, and devils would come on him and he called David in and this little psalmist David would come in and play his harp and sing praises and the Bible says and, and the spirit, the evil spirits would just leave. You want to get rid of some devils in your life? Just start singing. Next time the devils just beating you up and telling you a bunch of junk, just start singing. Watch them run. They can't stand music. Praise and worship releases the prophetic. This is probably one of my favorite stories. Just once again about Jehoshaphat. Uh, it's, it's kind of a funny story because the, the Bible tells us here these same ki kings had come to, to fight against Jehoshaphat. And Jehoshaphat has led his army with several other armies. They've gone to try to fight. They have a, a camaraderie. And they're down in this valley. And, and, they're, and the mountaintop above is where the enemy is. All around them. And they, they don't know what in the world they're going to do. And they cry out to God, the enemy is, is ten times bigger than them. So Jehoshaphat says, I wonder if I can find a prophet. And they found a good old guy named Elijah and said, Elijah, what do you, what do you say? What should we do? It's one of my favorite stories. And Elijah says, I don't know. I tell you what, I'm going to call a CAU worship team and we're going to have a praise service here first. And I ain't going to tell you nothing until they sing and we're going to worship. So the team came in, and they began to sing, and Elijah just began to worship and praise the Lord. <laughs> you know what crazy things come without a great worship? I'm just telling you, they're crazy. Elijah says, I tell you what, boy, um, this is what God says. Y'all down there in that valley, and it's all dry, and nobody's got any water, and you're dying of thirst. I want you to dig the valley full of ditches, and you're not going to see any water, rain, but come morning... Every ditch that you dig is going to be full. I just have pictured always in my mind how the response came from the soldiers. There are people of faith who can hear God say, do something stupid and enjoy doing it and have a song while they're doing it. It's amazing when you speak a word of faith to somebody about doing something stupid and they don't have much relationship with God and don't trust him. They usually pout and so can you imagine the guys out there and some of them are digging a ditch? Yeah, we're going to dig a ditch. It's 120 degrees. We hadn't had anything to drink and, and for, there is no clouds in the sky. What do you mean I'm going to dig a ditch? And they're out there going, you want a ditch? There's my ditch. That's my ditch. Hope you like that ditch, y'all. I'll show you ditch digging. There's my ditch. I'll even make two ditches. 
And then there are people who are the people of faith. Faithing people are crazy people. They had the shovel, and they're out there not only digging in 120-degree weather, they're singing, oh, hallelujah, the water is coming, hallelujah. And by the time the evening had done, they had done dig them a pool, a swimming pool. And the Bible says the next morning, without any wind, without any rain, God has gone down to the big river and grabbed him a ball of water. And God says, y'all catch this. And he throws it and the water rolls in, rolls in and fills that whole valley. And the guys in no faith had a straw trying to suck up some, man, I'm all raised, there ain't none left. And the other guys, they were doing the back flip. And God said, that's just a little bit that I'm going to do because the enemy woke up early in the morning. God all made them have tacos for supper and they were all sick and got up early, bad pizza, something. And they got up early in the morning when the sun was coming over the horizon and the sun shone down on the water and made it look like blood. And the stupid idiots up there said, the Israel's come to fight us and they've killed each other. Let's go get them. And they ride down without their, without their nine mils, without their, uh, anyway, they, they ride down <laughs> just to get the, and the army of Israel just destroys them. Can I tell you that you will get more answers from God in praise and worship than you will in prayer? It's like it always needs to cap. I would say praise and worship, prayer and praise and worship. I think the capstone is always what is foundational and top and bottom. And if you do, if you do, if you'll cover praise and worship as faithing, it's amazing what God will then whisper to your heart and how he'll talk to you and how he'll give you an answer. And if he doesn't do anything but hold you, you have come into his presence and he's made his throne there and he'll wrap his big old arms around you and say, look, this ain't your battle, it's mine. Or this is the way I'm going to fix this. Or this is what's going to happen. Or just be at peace. Just do what I say to do. Psalms 100. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord. Can I, can I tell you, if you ain't got any pr rhythm... <laughs> And you can't dance. Let me just tell you, you don't have to have rhythm to dance. You can jump up and down. That's appropriate in the scriptures. You can dance before the Lord. Can I encourage you to dance? Now, some of you start at home, you know. <laughs> I just, just a thought, okay? Just, you know, start at home and, and loosen up and dance and worship and move a little bit and get a little excited and stomp your feet and, and, and just, just move your body. That's good. Some of you say, I can't sing. Okay. This is your permission to make a joyful noise. Because you can say it, you can, you can declare it. So make a joyful noise to the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know ye that the Lord, he is God. It is he that has made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving. Enter into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name. For the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting. His truth endureth to all generations. Well, that's a scripture to memorize. And then it's a scripture to do. Let your praises ring out. Let your worship be pure, heartfelt. And y'all, we'll have victory. Faithing will initiate the miraculous. And God will come in and do something grand for you. I believe that. Is the devil taking your song? Yeah, he's stolen your harp. Break free. Say, Lord God, let me be an instrument of your, of your praise and your worship. Fill me up with you and then send me forth in war to battle.